Well, I hope that you have had a blessed week in spite of all that may have happened to you, that your week has been wonderful. But that was last week. You know, I've, I've been sort of paying attention. The Lord brought it to my attention a, a few weeks back that, you know, sometimes we look at Sunday as being the last day of the week, but it's not at all. Sunday is the first day of the week. And what a greater way to start your first day of the week, your new week, than to start it in the house of the Lord. Church doesn't save us, but I, was li I like what I was, something I was listening to this morning. But church doesn't save us. Church is not our salvation in itself. But church is a privilege and an honor that we get to participate in because that we are saved and we know Jesus is our Lord and Savior. So you didn't have to come to church this morning. You got to come to church. Amen? Amen. So we praise God and we worship Him for being such a wonderful, loving God and Savior to us this morning. I'm going to take a little bit different vein than I typically do. This morning I'm going to uh, I, I usually read from the New International Wording because of, of its ease of uh, understanding. And it's actually the most common read version of Scripture that's, that's known in the world today. But I'm going to read, be reading from the Amplified Bible. A traditional verse of Scripture, if you would, or a, a, a very common story that's found in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. We know that as you're turning there in your Bibles, in Daniel chapter 3, we know that, that there are three Hebrew boys that come up uh, under um, the, the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, if you would, and Nebuchadnezzar gives them new names, if you would. Um, we know that these Hebrew boys, Hebrew, uh, understanding Hebrew and Jewish Israelites are all one and the same. It's, it's this different terminology for the same people group. These Hebrew boys were anointed by God. And as Nebuchadnezzar found himself making a decree, uh, decree that Daniel didn't adhere to, and neither do these three Hebrew boys that, that he would be worshipped, I mentioned this, I think, last week or a couple weeks ago. Sometimes we look at Nebuchadnezzar and say, well, Nebuchadnezzar, he was, just, he was just a mean king. He was just a bad king. But I want you to understand that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, we really can't blame, ever blame our actions on anybody else because we all make decisions, okay? But he was influenced. He was influenced by his leadership, if you would, or the leadership that was under him. So we find that Nebuchadnezzar uh, is influenced by his leadership to set decrees in place that, that he would be worshipped or, if you would, he would fill that place of God. So in that, we find that Daniel and now these three Hebrew boys, they decide, they make a decision. Again, life is full of decisions. They make a decision that, hey, we're going to stand for God. We're going to stand for him. Miss Whitney, could you cut this fan off for me, please, ma'am? So as Nebuchadnezzar stands up against God, if you would, we see that people are willing to stand for God. That's something in this day and time that we need to understand. And I, I preached a few weeks ago, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers of darkness. We're not battling against people, but we should stand for what is right with God, not in a means of warring with people necessarily. But as we do those things, sometimes we have to understand as we go through spiritual warfare that when we engage in spiritual warfare, war is tough. How many veterans do we have in the house? Do we have any at all? A few. Now, when you were in warfare, when you, those of you that are, were veterans, were, when you went to war, when you went to war, did you anticipate when you went to war that nobody's ever going to shoot anything at you? Nobody's going to... You know, 
that, that would be foolish to think because it's war, right? You know? So, so we find that, that when, we, when we are engaging in spiritual warfare, you know, and, and so, some of you, you older ones know who I'm talking about. You younger ones are, are probably getting it by now. Uh, sometimes I need to show a, a short video clip of him just so all of you all will know. Uh, one, one of my favorite characters, I've I got a few favorite characters, and I'm dating myself real big here, but one of my favorite characters was Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim and his ukulele, and, and, and Tiny Tim came along during what, you know, was, was the, for you younger people, it was the hippie movement, and Tiny Tim had long, kinky, curly hair, and he always wore a three-piece suit, and he, he was a tall, skinny guy. Of course, I think everybody is tall. But he, he, he played a ukulele, the tall, skinny guy with the long, curly hair. He's playing the ukulele, and Tiny Tim s- sang a song, his song, the only song that he ever recorded to my knowledge was Tiptoe through the tulips with me. And it, it's, it's a song about everything is wonderful and great and bright in life. But the reality of it is we know that life is not like that. Even life for us as believers, and if you're not here as a believer, I'll tell you, I'm, you will, I'm trusted you will become a believer. And, but even when you become a believer, everything is not going to be perfect in life. In fact, you may discover that, that, that the battles in life will become more intense and closer together because you have, you have entered into spiritual warfare. Now, the prince of this world is, is the prince of darkness, Satan. The, you, you know, sometimes we, we, we hear people say, and, and it happens among Christian people a lot of time, I'm sending Satan right back to hell where he came from. He didn't come from there. Satan came from heaven. Okay? He's a fallen angel. Satan's domain is not hell. That is, that is an eternal place in the abyss where he will dwell, where he will be put someday. But right now, the, 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 the satanic forces that exist, if you would, exist in the domain that we live in. We share. We are co-inhabitants with the works of darkness as we live in this world. Okay? So, so we find ourselves in, if, if we are going to live in this world, does anybody else live in other, any other world besides this one? Before we go any farther, I want to find out. Okay. We are in this world, but not of this world as, as believers, okay? But we're in this world until Jesus calls us home or he returns and calls his church out. So we find ourselves in spiritual warfare. Continually. It's going to happen. Nebuchadnezzar chapter 3. Let me read. Verses 19 through 26. I'm reading this morning from the Amplified Bible. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and his facial expression was changed to antagonism against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, facial expressions tell us a lot sometimes, don't it? You guys know what it's like when your wife gives you that look, don't you? You kids know what it's like when mom gives you that look, don't you? You know, facial expressions tell us a lot. His facial expression had changed. Therefore, apparently he was a bit upset with these three young men because therefore he commanded that the furnace should be heated seven times hotter than it usually was heated. That's... That's pretty important to us. We'll get back to that. And he commanded the strongest men in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Again, in verse 20, that first part of that verse, when he commanded the strongest men in his army to do that, okay? That's very important as well to us. Verse 21, Then these three men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, or their undergarments, their turbans, and their other clothing, and they were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Cast into indicates they were thrown down. 
Verse 22, therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames and the sparks from the fire killed those men who handled Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Strong men, but yet they were consumed. Verse 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the burning, fiery furnace. Now, I don't know how much time elapses between verse 23 and verse 24. I have no idea. Perhaps, I, I could imagine there was a, a, few, a few minutes maybe, a few moments, um, maybe nothing extensive. But then in verse 24, then Nebuchadnezzar the king saw and was astounded. And he jumped up and he said to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered, True, O king. He answered, Behold, I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire. And they are not hurt. And the fourth, and the form of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now, that's different than the King James wording. The King James wording is the only wording that uses son of God. And this is taken from a, a liter, literary he, Hebrew translation, if you would. But it's like the son of the gods. You understand, Nebuchadnezzar, and when we look at Scripture, Nebuchadnezzar was not yet a believer in Yahweh. So he does not acknowledge the son of God. So verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, your ser you servants of the Most High, come out and come here. I want you to notice what this king just said. He speaks to them and says to them, you come out and come here. You come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. Father, we thank you for the power of your word, the illustration that is given forth to us this morning. Let us preach it. Lord, let us minister to it to ears that are open to hear and hearts ready to receive. And let it be imparted into lives this day according to your will and your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Classical story. We've all heard it. We've all know it. But there's some simplistic points that happen in this account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The first thing I want you to see is it starts with a disrault opponent. Nebuchadnezzar is his name. Nebuchadnezzar, as I already alluded to, was influenced by his government, his council. I'm not here to make this a political message this morning. You're never going to win those battles, okay? And this is not about politics. It's not about political parties. It's not about anything that's going on around us in particular right now. But historically, government has always served to be a tool of Satan. Whenever nations rise and collapse, it happens on government. Whenever war is declared, war occurs, war occurs because of government. government governments, if you would, uh, are the, exactly what it says, they are the governing body of the societies that we live in. Historically, government has always served to be the tool of Satan to persecute the church. We as a nation exist right now the united states of america and and you know this is going out on uh extreme voice radio and if you don't have that by the way i, I welcome you to go check it out on the internet dave can we tell them our secret yet are we ready to let the secret the cat out of the bag so to speak do what it's up to me all right i'll let the cat out of the bag who's got an iphone who's got a droid okay don't do it during church, 
But when you get out of church today, you can actually go to your app store and you can search Voice of Praise Worship Center and you can find an app on your phone and you can download it and you can listen to EV Radio anytime you want to. And as Dave uh, loads, po- loads the podcast of the messages, you have an app. You can sign up for push notices. We can let you know what's going on in the church. It's just started. They just released it in the last few days. We've got some refining to do, but there's apps available on your smartphone if you don't have a smartphone you can get one go to your local Verizon store or US Cellular or whoever okay but the reality of it is that in everything that's happened the church has been persecuted we are here because of a persecution the United States of America and this is going out over EV radio to to all different parts of the world internet radio but we are Americans today and we exist America exists because of people that were under religious or Christian persecution if you would and that is why we're here right now that that is our basis of being here this king probably didn't realize that he was being motivated by a a dark spirit if you would but yet he was and he was influenced by the people of his council and maybe they didn't realize that they were being motivated by a dark spirit but yet they were And, and now he begins to behold these three Hebrew children three Hebrew children we call them they actually were grown men but three Hebrew boys he begins to behold them as a threat You know, sometimes I wonder if that's not the problem with the world. You know, out of all the religions of the world, and religions are many, I want you to know that. Religions are many. From 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 Eastern religions through uh, through the the religion of Islam, through ancestral worship, we could go on and on and on. And cult false religions, we could go on and on. Religions are many. Listen, religions are dangerous, but salvation in Christ is secure. I want you to know that. But out of all the religions of the world, the only religion that suffers the persecution if great magnitude is the Christian religion or the Jews. The Jews have suffered attempts of genesis to be genocide attempts more than any other people group of the world and yet God has preserved them because his word will come to pass. And, and you and I, we, we, are not, we, are, we, are, we are not Jews by blood, but we are Jews by the Spirit because we've been born of the Spirit of Christ. We are Gentiles, if you would, but we are born of a Jewish spirit. And, and therefore, the work of darkness hates us. Therefore, we are, if you would, arch enemy number one. We are a threat to the government of darkness just like these Hebrew boys were a threat to Nebuchadnezzar's government so Nebuchadnezzar begins to use strong strong arm tactic we see in the scriptures we read to you this morning that Nebuchadnezzar heated the furnace seven times hotter seven being very significant uh, of of ultimate if you would perfection or ultimate completion The, the, the furnace could not have gotten any hotter than it was it could not have, that, that signifies spiritually that, that it could not have gotten any hot, any hotter, the furnace itself would have melted down. It was as hot as it could get. Listen, for you and I, we need to realize that sometimes the warfare that we are in, sometimes it's going to seem like it just can't get any hotter than it is. Sometimes it's going to seem like it just can't get any worse. Sometimes, you know, I think the I think the Lord takes us from battles to, to battle. He takes us from furnace to furnace. I've been in some. I think it couldn't get any worse, and then lo and behold, something happens. It seems just a little bit worse. But God prepares us in those things. But this signifies that that it's not going to get any worse. And then He uses the strongest men in His army. 
Hebrews or Jews, if you would, are typically small people. They're short people. I fit right in. They're shrewd business people. But in particular, they're small people. These three guys probably were not a physical threat at all to Nebuchadnezzar. But yet, somehow in his thinking, somehow in his reasoning, he, he is not going to allow for error. He is not going to allow for mistake. He's not going to allow for anything to happen. And he dispatches the strongest men that he has to contain these three small, probably small guys and bound them up hand and foot to throw them in the fire. It's not just... Watching them, it's, we're going to bound these guys up. We're, they probably, probably used twine, uh, sisal rope, something like that, and, and bound them hand and foot. They made sure that they couldn't. I mean, my goodness. You know, if you take three little guys and tie their hands and foot up, my poor, my dear old grandma should have been able to handle them. But we find that An insecurity, if you would. So the enemy used strong arm tactics. And all of this speaks of the insecurity of the enemy's ability to carry out a proposed mission of destruction. Let me tell you something. Some of you in this place this morning, you're going through stuff, you're going through battles, you're going through difficulties. It seems like the furnace is seven times hotter. It's not going to get any hotter than it is right now. It seems like the enemy has tried to bind you hand and foot. He's, he's, he's assigned his strongest imps of hell and, and put them on your case. It seems like that he's doing everything he can. Listen to me. Take that as a compliment because he is insecure in his t attack upon you because he he realizes that he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world and he knows that and then then the fiery furnace the fiery furnace to when we think about the fiery furnace, you know, we think about the, fire, the fiery furnace, man, that's a, that's a place we don't want to be. The fiery furnace is not the place that I, I want to go to. I'd rather go to the beach where the sharks don't bite. Amen. I'd rather go to the, I'd rather go rather go to the mountains where the mosquitoes don't bite. The fiery furnace is not where I want to go. The fiery furnace. But listen, some you know sometimes our perception is our. In fact, really all the time, our perception is our real reality. It's just it's just like Sister Faye back here. You know, she's out in the nursery. Bless her heart. I shouldn't be picking on her when she's not in the room. She thinks West Virginia is good. That's her perception. That's, it's not a reality, though, but it's reality to her. Go Hokies. Amen. Our perception is our reality. Sometimes when we hear the thoughts and we hear the words and we, we think the thoughts of fiery furnace, we're thinking, oh, no, this is going to be bad. This is going to be awful. I don't want to go through this. And granted, none of us probably want to. But I want you to begin to think, instead of thinking of it as the fiery furnace, I want you to start thinking of it as the pit of victory. The pit of victory. The fiery furnace itself was a fiery pit. And, and, and when you study out the historical, what is believed, what is, was probably... What is probably the design of the fiery furnace? It was a pit. It was a deep pit that was deep enough that a person could not climb out of, if you would, on their own accord. It was a pit deep enough. But in this pit, the fire was fueled from the bottom, which is reasonable to think about. 
And, and as this fire is fueled from the bottom and the, the pit is deep, it's heated seven times hotter than it, than it usually was, which means there is complete intensity. It's not going to get any worse. But I want you to see in there, there are some metaphoric illustrations, if you would. Because in the metaphoric illustration, I don't know why. I'm, I've never discovered, if you would, anybody that had a particular opinion, if you would, on why. But they left these Hebrew boys fully clothed in every single part of their clothing. Even their outer garments was left Upon their back. I look at that and I see a metaphoric comparison that these guys were ready to go wherever they needed to go. You see, we're to put on the full armor of God. We're to be fully clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when we're thrown into the pit of victory, or the fiery furnace as we call it, when we're thrown into the pit of victory, we're fully clothed. I don't know that the clothes did them any good, but metaphorically, it illustrates to me that they were prepared to go there. Now, before going there, we have no indications whatsoever in the Word of God that before being cast into that pit, that pit that burned from the bottom that was heated seven times hotter, couldn't get any hotter than they were. These Hebrew boys had never witnessed, if you would, a manifest presence of Jesus Christ or God. God and Jesus the same person. You know that, right? They never have witnessed the manifest presence of Jesus Christ. There's nothing to lead us to think that or nothing scripturally evident of that. So now they find themselves in the bottom of a pit, a metaphoric illustration of hell, if you would. But in the midst of the hell that they have been cast into, now... They have an encounter, a, at least a visual encounter. And apparently, I, I'm assuming that there is an audible encounter with Jesus Christ in the pit of hell. Are you with me? Are you with me? They went into the pit prepared. They went into the pit because of decisions they had made that I will stand for Christ or Yahweh for them in that day. I will stand for Yahweh. I will not deny Him. I will stand for Him. I will not bow. I'll choose to burn. They go into that pit prepared. That pit that should have consumed them. It consumed the people that cast them into the pit. But now they are there and in the midst of the pit, they find themselves seen Hearing and walking with Jesus. I want you to know this. Sometimes Jesus allows us to get in the fiery pit before we can see him. Did you know that? Everybody in this room probably would say, uh, even, even, if, even if it was in your remote thinking, everybody in this room probably would say, I'd like to know what Jesus looks like. I'd like to see, I would really love to see Jesus. You want to see him? Make your way to the fiery pit. The pit of victory. You want to see Jesus? You want to show up? Well, I, I, I want to walk with Jesus. I want to talk with Jesus. You want to walk with Jesus? You want to talk with Jesus? Find yourself in the bottom of the pit, the furnace that is seven times hotter. That's where Jesus is going to show up in your life. That's not a pursuit of mine again, but I'm sure it's probably not a pursuit of yours. But often if we're going to be followers of him, we are going to find themselves there. So, so even amidst all this smoke and stuff, they're able to see Jesus. 
So maybe our prayers in the bottom of the pit, maybe, just maybe, our prayers, you know, you throw me in the bottom of a pit, you know, even before I get to the bottom of the pit, I'm going to be whining, I'm going to be sniveling probably, I'm going to be crying. But, but when we're in the bottom of our pit, what, what do we usually do when we're in the bottom of our pit? We're, when we're in the bottom of our pit, this is most of the time the way we are. We... I should have fixed me up something for an altar rail. We'll find us, we'll make us an altar somewhere and we'll hang over it like a, uh, like a pair of uh, wet blue jeans on the clothesline. We're saying, oh, Jesus, get me out of this pit. Help me, Jesus, get me out of this pit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's us. Get us out of this pit, Jesus. Get us out of this pit. But maybe... Just maybe while we're in the pit, we need to be saying, Jesus, help me see you because I know that you're in here somewhere. I know that you're in here among the smoke and among the fire, among the burning coals. I know that you're in this pit. I know that you're in this trial. You know, we used to sing a song, Lord, you can make this trial a blessing. You know, we, we, somewhere in this, let me see through the thick smoke and see you, Jesus. Let me see through the thick smoke to see you, Jesus. So what happens in those fiery pits, those pits of hell, if you would? My microphone's coming apart on me here. The fire of the pit will make manifest our faith. The fire of the pit will make manifest our faith. Now, you and I can go around. Listen, there's no way that we're Christians without being people of faith. There's no way that, we're, there's no way that we can be believers without being people of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. We, if, if you had to, if, if you, you know... If, if we have to touch, feel, and see, and use all our senses, then we really haven't used faith. We're just believing in what we've been able to use our senses to and achieve believing through that, if you would. We really, but we are people of faith. We're people of faith. These boys did not see Jesus in the fire before they went in there. They were people of faith that believed that if it was God's will, he would deliver them, but they still refused to bow to Nebuchadnezzar. So the fire will make our faith manifest. James, in his epistle, he alludes to it that faith alone without works is dead. Now, sometimes we think, when we think of works, we think about that in the sense of doing good deeds for other people, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's appropriate believing. That's, that's, that's good theology, if you would. But, but really, when it comes down to it, faith without works alone is dead. Faith alone without works is dead when it comes to that. If we never go through, if we are never thrown into a pit of victory, if we're never thrown into a pit that is burning with thick smoke and fire and ashes, and we never come through those pits, we never see Jesus through the smoke, and we never walk around with him and hear his voice in the midst of the pit, then we will never be people that are manifest in our faith. In other words, they need to happen in our life. Now, this is not the part of being a Christian that makes us say, Whoa, hallelujah, glory to God. This is, the, this is, that, this is that part that, that, well, I don't like this part, so good pastor. But if, if, our, if the, our faith in our God is going to be manifest, we're going to have to walk through some furnaces. We're going to have to be bound up. We're going to have to be thrown into the pit of hell, if you would, at different times in our life. This, the test will create the testimony. You can't testify something that you've never been through. 
Don't come tell me if, if you got called into court today and somebody says, if somebody says you get subpoenaed to court and they said, now I want you to tell me, uh, uh, Nathan, I want you to tell me what you saw happen in that wreck down here uh, at the intersection of Route 20 and 52. I want you to tell me what you saw there. Nathan said, well, I'll just tell you now, I was working for the railroad way up next to Grundy's, and, and I, so I didn't really see a whole lot, but I'll tell you what I think about it. The, his testimony is going to get thrown out because he has no testimony. He's just going by what he heard his brother-in-law Scott said, say because he was working at the bank. In order to have a testimony, we must endure the test. In order to have a testimony, we must face the test. In order, if you would, to have our faith be made manifest, we have to go through the pit of hell, if you would. But which is more so a pit of victory. You see, when we begin to see through the smoke the victory will come. And when that happens in our lives, here's what happens. When that takes place, when that occurs, outsiders begin to see God in our circumstance. You see, we, we, we talk a lot, and we worship God. You know, we used to sing songs about, you know, three the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. You know, there's been songs written. There's been there's children's Bible books and all kinds of things, all kind of accounts of this classical story. But listen to me, something very important that happened that we sometimes don't focus on is the outsiders that saw God in the circumstance. And that outsider in particular here is Nebuchadnezzar. What, what happens with Nebuchadnezzar is really just about as important as what happened with the three Hebrew children. Because Nebuchadnezzar sitting, he's sitting over on the stool and he's eating, you know, his Doritos and drinking his Diet Dr. Pepper and, and he's, you know, he's just waiting to hear the sound of as the boys are thrown into the pit. That's what he wants to hear. The cries, they're not going to last long because the pit is so hot. They're not going, it's not going to be at length at all. But, but Nebuchadnezzar knows when he hears the cries of anguish, when he hears the cries of as they're dragging those boys up to the pit, he's wanting to hear them say, no, 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 please don't, no. He's waiting to hear that, but it never comes. It never happens. He was wanting to hear the agonies of these boys as they were helplessly burned alive. But for whatever reason, and we don't know why, and I like to call it reading between the lines, and I ask you to excuse me for reading between the lines, but whatever Nebuchadnezzar was sitting there waiting on, it never happened, and he never heard it. But something got Nebuchadnezzar's attention. We don't know exactly what it was, but something caught his attention. Now, I know, I know Jason Crabb wasn't around at that time, but, but I just wondered if, if, if maybe that, that those Hebrew boys were down there and saying, He never promised that the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. So, or just maybe it was total silence. Maybe it was just the absolute silence of nothing happening that got Nebuchadnezzar's attention. But whatever it was, it prompted this king to get up and to walk to the edge of that furnace. By now, apparently, it's cooled down because otherwise we know from the soldiers being consumed, the king would have been consumed. 
Things are cooling off in the furnace a little bit. The, the hottest part of the furnace is now over with. These boys have went through the hottest part of it. And Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace, scratching his head. He said, hmm. Sarah had an aunt that used to count like this. One, two, three. She used her fingers. One, two, three. Wait a minute. One, two, three, four. And he turns to his counsel and he says, Tell me I'm just messed up here, guys. Wasn't it, wasn't it just three, you know? Wasn't it one, two, three that we, what, that we threw in there? Yeah, you're right, O oh king. You got it, man. You're doing good. You're doing good, brother. You can count to three. But, but guys, there's, there's four in there. And one of, one of them, he, he, he looks different than all the rest. He looks like one of the sons of God. He's different. And he's in there walking around. And, and those other three, they're not tied up anymore. What in the world is going on? And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that this got the attention of Nebuchadnezzar. And he calls for these three to walk out. Now, that's pretty significant to us this morning. Because I want you to understand this. It doesn't matter how deep the pit of hell is that you've been going through. It doesn't matter how hot it's been. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It, you know, I, I know that it does to you in the sense that, that yeah, and yes, we care and we're pray, we pray for you. We pray for one another. We all have our episodes. We have our times of going through this. And so when I say it doesn't matter, it, it does matter, but you get my drift. The, the thing about it is, the, now, now it, it's, it's not the fact that it was the fiery furnace. It's not the fact that, that they were prepared before they went in. It's not the fact that they made a, made a decision. Now it comes down to the time Nebuchadnezzar recognizes there's a fourth man in the fire with them. They're not burnt. Their clothes is not burnt off of them. They're, they're not touched by the fire. The Bible says they're not even a smell of smoke on them. But now the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar calls for them and they come out of the pit of hell on their own power. Think about that. When we walk through the pit of hell hand in hand with Jesus, the time will come when we can walk out of the pit on our own. Doesn't mean we're not spiritually motivated because it's the Spirit of God is the, is the preservative that kept them there. It was the, it was the, the preventive that kept them from burning. It, it, it is everything they needed. But when the time come, their testimony was complete. They, they, their, their witness had been made fulfilled. They come walking out of the pit of their own. Listen to this. And we talk about, and it's a different illustration, different situation. We talk about when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb and he looked over and he said, loose him and let him go. These boys didn't even have to be loosed. They were free when they came out of the pit. The fire was what God had ordained and used to release the cords that had them bound. In other words, what was designed to consume them, listen to this, what was designed to consume them, in reality is what freed them. And the devices that sometimes look like are designed to consume us may very well be what frees us. Are you with me? So the fiery furnaces that we experience are never pleasant, but they are beneficial. 
the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, your God and my God is the benefactor. And I've preached this, and the Lord's put it in my spirit so strong the last several weeks. When we go through our stuff, when we come from stuff to stuff, go through stuff to stuff, and we come through as a testimony and a witness unto Jesus Christ, He is lifted up, He is edified, He is glorified, and when He is lifted up, He will draw all men nigh unto Him because He is the one receiving the glory and the honor. So while you and I go from stuff to stuff, if we are faithful, if we are the testimony because of the test, we are the faithful witness. God is lifted up, and he begins to draw people. Because let me tell you this. I'm getting ready to bring up my next scripture there, Dave, or whoever's up there. But, but listen to this. There is somebody that's going through stuff just like you. But that somebody else that's going through stuff just like you may not know how to lean on Jesus like you do. That person that's going through stuff just like you may not be quite as encouraged as you are or quite as strong as you are. But when that person sees you go through the fiery furnace and you come out with not even the smell of smoke on you, then that person can look at you and say, well, if God will do it for them, he'll do it for me. If he's done it for them, surely he's going to do it for me. And I'm encouraged because I've seen this person walk through that, so I know that I can go through that if I will trust God. And you and I become a living prayer or a living prayer testimony of who God is and what God can do. Verses 28 and 29 of that same chapter. Here's what happened. They walk out, Nebuchadnezzar sees them, their clothes is not burned or anything else. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. First time that he acknowledges Yahweh. He still really didn't understand who he was, but he knew that it was the God of these three boys. And Nebuchadnezzar blessed God. He says, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who believed in, trusted in, and relied on him. And they have set aside the, the king's command and yielded their bodies rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. They were willing to give their own bodies, Nebuchadnezzar said. He said, that means, Nebuchadnezzar says, that speaks volume to me. You know, actions, actions always speak louder than words. And no, you're not going to find that in the scripture, but it's true. They're willing to give up their own lives, their own bodies, and everything. They're, they're willing to give that up to show their faithfulness to their God. He said, therefore, I make a decree that any people... Nation and language that speaks anything amiss, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Their houses will be made a dunghill, for there is no other God who can deliver in this way. So, Lord, may our eyes be open. May we see through the fire May we see through the thickest of smoke and see you right in the pit of hell where we're walking through right now. God, help us to realize that in the midst of the pit, you are being glorified. In the midst of hell, Seven times hotter. More important than getting out is I need to see you. I need to see you in the midst of my pit. It's not just a fiery pit, it's a pit of victory. That you may be glorified and all will know that you are God. That 
you are God. Amen. Every one of us in this room have had seasons in our life that we've had to walk through what seemingly was the pit of hell. It come through, could come through sickness. It could come through disease. It could come through marital infidelity. It could come through false accusations. It could come through mistreatment by other people somebody very dear to you it could come in all different kind of ways it could it could very well be coming to us as as Christians in this nation but God will be made manifest in the fiery furnace if we'll look through the smoke and see his face and hear his voice He's there to walk with us and to talk with us. He is there to minister to our need. And maybe that's you today. If you're sitting in this room this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's very urgent, very important that you get saved. The Bible says there's no other way. There's no other way to, to, to know God, to see God, other than through Jesus Christ. It's very important. It's very important because, you see, that person that Nebuchadnezzar saw, and he said, it's a son of the gods that he later recognized as being the God of, of, Abraham, or of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When you study Old Testament Doctrine, Old Testament theology, it was none other. You see, Jesus didn't just show up when he was born to the Virgin Mary. Jesus, the Son of God, always has been because he is God. And it was a manifest presence, not an incarnate presence, but a manifest presence of Jesus Christ that showed up in that pit. And more than anything else that you and I need is a manifest presence of Jesus Christ to be in our life. If you're unsaved, you need that. If you're here and you know Jesus, but maybe the, maybe the pit has been hot, it's been deep, and it's been long, you need to see Jesus in the smoke. I just want you to bow your heads with me just a moment. I promise you I won't embarrass you. I promise you I won't go out of this room and say, well, you know, so-and-so, you know, they slipped their hand up. This is just me and you time. But you're here right now. First, the, first, the first and most important need that could exist in this room this morning or any other place we go is the need of Jesus Christ in your life as a Lord and Savior. Is there anybody in this room that would say to me, Pastor, I would like to know how to receive Jesus into my life. I need to receive Jesus in my life as Lord and Savior. Would you just quickly, without any embarrassment to you at all, would you just slip up your hand? Anybody at all in this room? Anybody at all? Okay. I want to ask you this. It's not an embarrassment. We all go through these seasons. In fact, if we didn't go through a season of a fiery furnace every once in a while, I, I, would, I would have to wonder what's wrong. But you're here this morning. And you're in the midst of a fiery furnace. All hell is broken out in your life. You have are, you are found yourself being thrown into the pit. You feel bound hand and foot. But let me tell you what is meant for your destruction is going to be your release. That's you. Pastor, I've been thrown in. The fire's burning. It's the hottest fire I've ever been in in my life. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand real quickly without embarrassment. Anybody in this room? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others? Thank you. 
And I promise you I wouldn't embarrass you and I'm not going to, okay? But I want you, those of you that raised your hand, I want you to know this. You are not alone. You are not alone. All of us have been there. Different ways, different magnitudes, different occurrences. Every one of us in this room have been in a similar place to where you're at. Maybe not exactly, but similar. So nobody nobody stands here or sits here in this room in judgment of you. Doesn't matter where, how, why, or anything else. The most important thing is that we know that you're in a fiery furnace right now. We've been there. We know what it's like. And we want to join ranks with you. What is meant for your destruction could very well be your liberating. What is meant to consume you could be what is going to free you. But I would like to, for you to allow myself and the church body, as many as it would, to pray with you. So if you slipped up your hand today, and you're going through the fire. You're there. Hell is hot. The fire is burning. You're crying. You're desperately pleading for a way out. We want to pray with you. So if you slipped up your hand, can I ask you to join me And as many of the church family that will come, and I know there are a lot of them that will, and we're just going to pray that God will give you the strength and the vision to see through the smoke, through the fire. And you're going to walk out of that furnace on your own. You're going to climb out. And you're going to climb out in victory. And you're going to climb out and someday you're going to look at somebody and you're going to tell them about the furnace you were thrown in that day. And you'll say, but God was faithful to deliver me out of it. He blessed me and I came climbing out. I was free. I was loose. There was nothing to bind me. And I came out because I met the Son of God in the midst of the fire. If you slipped up your hand, can we pray with you? I want this, I want everybody that can and will in the congregation this morning. I want all of y'all to come down. And if you raise your hand, I want you to make your way up here. And we're just going to believe that God is going to minister to you.